show me something, give me data, talk to me a customer, like give me a prototype. Like the more you can actually touch and feel it or talk to a customer, the more you are actually burning down the question of like, can we do this and do people want it? And that's like the two questions. Hi everyone, welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer and EVP of AI at Microsoft. Today, tech is a part of nearly every aspect of our lives. We're in the early days of an AI revolution promising to transform our lived experiences as much as any technology ever has. On this podcast, we'll talk with the folks behind the technology and explore the motivations, passion, and curiosity driving them to create the tech shaping our world. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm co-host Christina Warren, Senior Developer Advocate at GitHub. And I'm Kevin Scott. And today we are bringing you an interview with Mike Schrepfer, who spent many years at Meta, but is now working on some really exciting projects through his investment firm, Gigascale Capital, as well as some super interesting philanthropic work with Additional Ventures and the Carbon to Sea Initiative. Yeah, I have wanted to have Mike on the podcast for a while now because every time he and I chat about what he's doing now, I am incredibly enthused to have someone with the platform building and uh, technical uh, experience that Mike has applying that same bag of tricks to some of these really gnarly problems that we have related to climate change. Um so I, I hope in our conversation with him, we're going to hear about some of those uh, super fun things. But uh, he, he can go on for hours and hours and hours about both the entrepreneurs and the tech that they're working on that seem like they have a real and huge potential to help us solve some of these really gnarly climate problems. Which we need. I'm, I'm glad we have people like him um, taking those things on. So I'm really looking forward to hearing this conversation. All right, let's get into it. Mike Schrepfer is the founder of and a partner at Gigascale Capital, an early stage climate tech investment firm. In addition to his work with Gigascale, Mike started and serves on the board of the Carbon to Sea Initiative, is the founder of the philanthropic organization Additional Ventures, and is a senior fellow at Meta focused on artificial intelligence and the development of technical talent. Mike led Meta's engineering teams from 2008 to 2022 and serves as Chief Technology Officer from 2013 to 2022. He led the development of 8 gigawatts of clean energy infrastructure and technology and teams that enable Meta to scale to billions of people around the world and make breakthroughs in fields like artificial intelligence and virtual reality. Mike holds a bachelor's and master's degree in computer science from Stanford University. Mike, thanks so much for being on the show today. Glad to be here, Kevin. Thanks for having me. So you have had one of those uh, legendary Silicon Valley careers, uh, and I am going to ask you the same first question that I ask for everybody who's on the show, which is, how did you get interested in technology in the first place? Uh, you know, I, I don't know that there was a singular origin story. I mean, I in a funny twist of fate, I grew up in Boca Raton, Florida which, um, you know, people may know from, from two, two, two very different worlds. One is Seinfeld, who lampooned it with Del Boca Vista. Um, and uh, the other is, obviously, that was the birth of the IBM PC. And yep. so if you read the origin stories of Microsoft, which you, you know well, you hear the stories of Bill, uh, you know, flying into Miami airport and driving up to Boca Raton in the 80s to convince IBM to use DOS for their IBM PC, that was my hometown. I was there at that time, you know, as a kid. And so, you know, we had the, in the career days at school, you know, someone from IBM would always show up and talk about computers. Yeah. And my neighbor's dad worked at IBM. And so they had a PC junior, I remember, because it had the amazing uh, 16 color graphics, I think, with like King's Quest on that. Yep. So like, we, I think a lot of it was just like exposure plus video games. You know, my neighbor had the IBM PC, we can afford that. We had a Commodore, you know, VIC-20, and then a Commodore 64, which was the bomb. And, you know, so kind of had just like earlier exposure to that. And that was as a, as a young kid. And then as I got further on in school, you know, science and math was always really fun for me. And I think the real aha was in high school. I had a chance to take a physics class. And like, this was just a like, there was something about like, wait, with, with these five equations, I can explain 
how like objects move around in the world. And I can understand how light bends through a small pinhole. Like it was just, it was really fun. And that, I think that probably was the censure on like, when I go to college, I want to do something in science or engineering. Um, but I wasn't exactly sure yet till I got to, got to college, what I wanted to do. And were your parents in science and technology? They were not. They were in the radio business. They ran a really small little AM radio station. I actually had a um, had a uh, FCC license to broadcast as soon as I was you know old enough to do it because I would help them on nights and weekends run the radio station. So there was like some technology and like we had early CDs and things like that to kind of like help upgrade the radio station. And my dad was like very tech curious, like liked gadgets and stuff, but neither of them had an engineering or science background. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. A lot of people that are uh, in our age range had a f somewhat similar story. So, like, they came of age, like, right around the time the personal computing revolution was starting. Um, and, and they also, like, were, uh, you know, teenagers or kids uh, as video games were uh, on their ascendancy. And, like, those two things got many a computer science career underway. Um, but I'm sort of wondering, like, did you have role models, like, uh, in your schools? Like, was there any one person who was, because this is interesting, like, I, I don't think I did. Like, I, I grew up in rural Central Virginia, and, like, I can't point to one person. No one I knew. So yeah. it would be people I saw on TV or read about in books or things like that. Um, but I'm trying to think, and I, that is not to say, like, I did this all myself. It's more yeah. like there wasn't the person yeah. who was like, oh, I want to be like them when I grow up that I knew in person. Um, so, so, no. How did you how did you get from Boca Raton to Palo Alto? Like, how did you choose Stanford? Well, I knew I wanted to do engineering or I thought I wanted to do engineering, but I wasn't sure exactly. You know, when you're in high school, it's like, what does engineering mean? Um, and, and I liked computers. And so, it, you know, it, it was kind of basically just Stanford was kind of good at everything. They weren't as well known, but they're like all the engineering disciplines were good. They were actually good at most of the humanities, too. So I was kind of like and they didn't make you choose before you got there. Yeah. So it's like, oh, this would be a great place for me to like really understand which of these di different disciplines. I looked at a couple like all engineering schools and I was just like, I, I just, I don't know. What if I decide I want to do philosophy or something else? Um, you know, and so that was really the the drive. And I also just when I visited it, I did the little like they have the, you know, after you get accepted, you do the like overnight visit where you get to stay on campus. Then I did it there and at Princeton, which was the other place I was considering. And they got me right. They got me like in a dorm with a bunch of nerds. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. They're all nerds. They have Macs. We're talking about computers. Like, and it's sunny out. Like, this is amazing. This yeah. is, clearly, yeah. if I had this opportunity, I'd, I'd be a dummy not to take it. <laughs> and so what was it like once you got to Stanford? So when when, when was this? This was... Uh, so like, it would be 93, 1993. Gotcha. And so like, that was a super interesting time at Stanford. Uh, so like, just a bunch of stuff going on in Silicon Valley and like a bunch of interesting people at Stanford. So what, what was that yeah. like? I mean, I distinctly remember my freshman dorm. It's like one person down the hallway from me had a, had an Apple Newton. Do you remember the Newton? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like pen based computer. I love like, that Whoa! device. You have a Newton. Like, and it was just, and I, for whatever reason, like the computers were back ordered, but I like brought my computer with me. So I had the first computer there. You know, we didn't have internet in the dorms. We had dial up. Um, there was like a little computer room in the basement that actually had internet with a, among other things, had a Next Cube in it. Um, so if you remember the old Next, because I think Next basically donated a bunch of computers to Stanford to try to get people to actually buy them. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so it was just like it was just like whoa, this is so cool. There's just like so much stuff to do here. And then I was like, I kind of went through a, and you'll hear this theme throughout my life, like a, how do I run experiments to figure out? It's like I want to do engineering. What does that mean? Like. Let me just start taking what's the closest proxy to this. And so I took the intro to computer science class, the intro to double E class at the same quarter, you know, because I'm like, maybe I want to do electrical engineering and build computers and chips, or maybe I want to do the CS thing. And I kind of took them in parallel and, and um, both amazing classes, CS 106A and E80, I think it was in double E. But I was like, by the end of E80, we were like, we built like a counter you know, um, or this, like we spent all this time cause it's like hard to build circuits yep. and like every week in computer science, we were building something new. It's like, Oh, here's a basically Google maps directions thing. Here's like a blackjack game. Like here's, I was like, this is amazing. This is a very high leverage tool. <laughs> like yeah. this is amazing. I sit in front of my computer 
And then three days later, this new thing pops out the other end that like is a fully useful piece of software. Yeah. I was like, I, I basically, I was hooked at that point. And like, that's what's kept me in the industry for like 25 years. It's just like that feeling of like, whoa, nothing to like, we made this thing. Like, you know, that's a lot more fun than any other hobby I can think of. Yeah. Although I'm, I'm going to want to get back to this in a minute, but I, I think when you were at Meta, uh, and I suspect even with what you're doing right now, certainly everything benefits from being able to operate at software speed, but it also at a certain level of scale, like you actually do have to think about the hardware again, uh, oh, because sure. you, you just can't, you know, pick off the shelf, uh, like a, a quantity or form factor compute or networking or storage that meets the needs of the thing that you're trying to build. And so like, I, I totally understand why, I mean, like I, I kind of made the same decision, uh, myself, uh, but then, you know, found myself much later in my career caring a lot about hardware again. Yeah, me too. And I like, and we can talk cause you know, again, I was just a, such a fortunate time cause like the internet you know, the World Wide Web, we already had Gopher and a bunch of other things, but and Telnet and, and um, uh, what was it, News, Newsnet, NNTP, yep. um, when I got there. But then, you know, the web obviously came out while I was at Stanford. And so that was just like amazing. But on the hardware side, I agree with you. I mean, the, you know, when I joined Facebook, now Meta in 2008, you know, those first couple of years, everyone thinks of Meta as a software company. And I was like, those first couple of years, like our biggest problem was the site was just growing so quickly that we, we had all these emergency fire drills, like we're literally going to run out of capacity and everything's going to crash. And so a combination of like software optimization and like, how do we uncork the like hardware growth rate thing? And as you well know, as well as I do, is like, you can't just like order a new data center and have it next week. You're like, oh crap, we got to And like, I remember in these conversations, it's like, okay, we're going to build a data center. Like we have a two to four year like lead time between like go and like it's operational. Like how much capacity do you need? And I was like, I don't know. Like it's yep. so hard to predict that far in advance. So like we literally have to order steel now and like buy some land. So like you can't you can't tell me this in nine months. You need to tell me now how yeah. much we're how much we're building. And so like that was just a like. And then we built you know lots of data centers. And then we made another move into consumer hardware. And so I joke I made two transitions: one from software to hardware, and then. When we got into consumer hardware, it's like, oh, we've been building data centers. I know this hardware thing. This is easy. And it's like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's a totally different game when, like, if the consumer returns the thing, you've now lost a ton of money yeah. um, because, like, you just ate everything. And so making sure that they like it and there's customer support and your price, like, there's a whole different ball game in consumer hardware. So it's like software, enterprise hardware, consumer hardware in terms of, like, difficulty, I would say. Um, and so that has been really fun and is actually informed a lot of like in my climate tech investing we're investing mostly in hardware and a lot of it is enterprise but some of it's consumer um you know we're selling products that your average person's going to buy and so so anyway so we can talk a lot about that it is definitely a shift and a lot of fun well there's there's sort of an interesting philosophical thing here like i, I think one of the things that has made you so successful and the companies that you work for so successful is there is this underlying assumption that no matter what the problem is or the thing that you're going to go tackle next, that you're going to be able to figure it out. Um, but but sometimes like you can let yourself be overconfident and, you know, managing that balance between confidence and overconfidence. And, like you do have to be fearless. Like if you are fearful, like you will never get anything done. Uh, and it's like one of the things I'm most impressed by what you're doing right now, because some people look at this bundle of you know, climate change issues and think that the problem is completely intractable. And and yet you are, you know, just with great enthusiasm, uh, you know, trying to leverage the, you know, the best of this you know, technological entrepreneurial mindset to try to fix things. But so, like, how have you thought about this, this tension? Uh, like, how do you temper your optimism with pragmatism yeah i mean i often describe myself as a as a grounded optimist or a practical optimist i think you know the the extreme of optimism is naivete is just like it actually doesn't work um and and i think so much of what you say is true and i i think you know there's this phrase stop energy which is like you're like oh shrimp i have this idea and you're like ah here's all the reasons you can't do that or that's not going to work right 
stop energy is so easy. It's so easy to be a critic and say, I thought of 30 reasons this doesn't work. It's so much harder to basically say, well, wait a second, let's think about this. Why would this work? And like, and let's talk about the, like the physical constraints that means that this is not possible. Like, do those exist? Are you positioned well in the market? Are you leveraging your strengths? Like all of those things. It is a much more constructive conversation. Um, and so, you know, it, the good news and getting back to this hardware software thing is the fun thing about hardware is like, you can model a lot of things out on paper. You know, if I told you I wanted to build a, you know, a chip with this much memory bandwidth and this many transistors, you can do some back of the math ma- envelope and they're like, yeah, you can't fab that right now. Yeah. So you can, you can try to convince me all you want, but like TSMC can't make it. Yep. So, you know, or, you know, in AR VR worlds, you know, you have these headsets and a big challenge is you need to get the field of view to be big. So I have a big screen in front of me. Well, you can model like, all right, I got to get a photon from back here from some slight light engine. It's got to kind of bend around and hit my eye. There's like only so many ways to get that photon to bend around. And optics is really well understood in physics. So you can do like index of refraction. You can model, given the material we're using, the maximum field of view you can get is X, Yeah. right? And I can't tell you how many started pitches I went through where they're like, well, we're going to build it with this using this thing. And we'd sit there and we'd be like, yeah, you can't, you, you can't, like it doesn't, you, you, you violated laws of physics at this point. Yeah. So I think you're like, are you violating laws of physics is like the starting point, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but there are plenty of products that don't violate the laws of physics, but you just like, you don't understand your customer or you're like, I think a lot of business try to go way too far out of their comfort zone. You know, when Intel tried to make microscopes, like that didn't work out well, right? It's like very far from chips. And so you kind of always want to take one step, like, I know part of this business, I'm just moving a little bit to the left as opposed to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm switching industries entirely. So there's a lot of questions like that you try to ask yourself to do it. And then the other thing I'd say is, is like, the constant question I ask is like, what's the cheapest, fastest, easiest experiment to learn more? Yeah. Can I mock it up in cardboard? Can I like go ask 30 people whether they want this thing? Yeah. Can I build one in my garage? Like, this is the place where I think smart people really get themselves in trouble. It's like, yeah. you try to spend too much time imagining and she's like, stop imagining, go do like, show me something, give me data, talk to me, a customer, like, give me a prototype. Like the more you can actually touch and feel it or talk to a customer, the more you are actually burning down the question of like, can we do this and do people want it? And that's like the two questions. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I think there's a related thing with smart people where sometimes it's very enjoyable to wallow in complexity, to like take yes. a very hard thing and like even to make it harder. And, and like there's this joy you can get from uh, from spending cycles there. But like the, those overly complicated things are almost never really useful. 100%. <laughs> I think I often describe when I'm working with people, I, I, this took me a long time to figure out is I think there's complexifiers and there's simplifiers. Yep. There's someone you give a big hard problem. They go like, here's 30 pages, but you really only need to understand three things. Like here's the three biggest things that matter here. Yeah. And if you want to get into details, I got it. But like, here's the thing. There's other people that come up with it. Like, here's 26 pages of detail. I've covered every base on this thing. <laughs> and you're like, that's not actually helpful. That's actually yeah. much worse. Yeah. And like, I find simplifiers are a secret weapon of a lot of organizations. Yeah. That's what we sought in our PMs at Meta. That's what I look for in the founders I back. Um, and it like repeatedly has, has, has been successful for me in finding people take a big complex gnarly thing and say, but these are the only, you know, only things that matter. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like you're giving the, uh, giving the listeners sage advice here. So like you compound these things and they get very interesting. So folks who have high learning rate, who know how to like experiment quickly, who are simplifiers, like you just sort of stack these together and like those, yeah. uh, like really, really the union of those things are just superpowers. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, so let's go back to Stanford. Um, so, you know, you're there in 93, you decide to take computer science over, uh, over double E. Um, yeah. What, what, what was the most interesting thing that you learned at Stanford? Like whether class or something you learned from a friend or, or an internship? Yeah. I mean, I think it gets back to your question on like, how do you have no fear about having to solve a problem, which is like, I think the best of computer science is like learning how to organize and decompose complicated things. If you go back to like, what is a data structure? What is an API? How do I layer things? How do I like, okay, I can program in Python. I don't need to know what the machine is doing. 
but then I can like start to learn C. I can learn assembly language. I can like look at the transistors on the chip. There's this very clean layering that allows me to abstract out complexity. Um, and I think that that sort of, that is probably by far and above the best skill because it gets back to that simplifier complexifier thing is like in everything in life, you have to be able to figure out how to, how to do that. You know, we're doing a climate tech investment. Someone shows up with this magic box, this magic box with air, water, and electricity comes in the side and jet fuel comes out the other side. Yeah. It's like, okay, I'm going to pretend for a second. I don't even know how this box works. I just trust you. It does. If it costs you a, you know, a thousand dollars a gallon to make that jet fuel, you do not have a business, right? Yeah. So I don't even care how the box works, but if you come and say, I can make it for five bucks a gallon, you're like, oh, now I have a bunch of questions about how that box works. And let's like tear apart whether that box works and it scales and it's going to be reliable. And so like being able to sort of move at multiple levels of detail and move up and down is by far and above the best. Um, I think CS also in a weird way teaches you, like I had this in feeling even in the 90s, that was like, wow, this field's moving so fast. Like languages were showing up all the time, chips were moving. And so it was like, the idea that you just like learn your thing and then I spend the next 30 years applying my thing was not the lesson I got. The lesson I got was like, you need to learn how to learn stuff because the thing you just learned is yeah. going to be obsolete in like a year. Yeah. And so if you want to have any longevity in this field, like you got to be constantly, you got to know the new language, the new framework, the new this, the new that. And so that kind of sense of like, all right, I just like, I, it's a meta process. I got to get good at learning. I got to get good at decomposing problems and like understanding what's important. And I feel like those skills, you know, I wish ever, like, I think everyone can do that regardless of their talent right. and their, and their background and like, um, the profession, I mean, um, and like, I think those have served me incredibly well through, throughout my career. Yeah, I think like the, I, I I have another question I want to ask you, but like I think the the other thing that people underappreciate is practicing learning makes it easier to learn, and so like I, I feel like it's one of the unfair advantages that I got as a computer scientist because yeah, like I've always assumed the half life of the technical yeah. stuff that's going into my head is very short, and so like I'm You're always, <laughs> but like it me it, it it lets you it lets you learn a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, and I, I'm guessing in your case, like it let you be fearless about going into climate investing. Uh, like, even yeah. though uh, like you just like, okay, well, I know how to learn. Like I can go learn this stuff uh, obviously with humility. Right. Uh, yes. Because it's very complicated, but I see it even with my children. Uh, once they figure out that learning is uh, fun and useful, uh, then they're in the learning loop and like it, it just sort of, you know, snowballs into something like very, yeah. uh, you know, very, very interesting. Yeah, exactly right. So was um, you know, the other question I have for you about Stanford is, um, was there a course that like brought everything together into like, oh my God, like I didn't realize uh, like I had this superpower to build something very complicated uh before you know because some schools do it mr miyagi style you know like you're yeah. wax on wax off and then one day you're fighting in a, a karate tournament and um and, yeah. and you didn't even know you were going to be able to do this thing and it's, it's like maybe a compiler course or an operating system course or a robotics yeah. course or something i mean it's honestly this is a crap answer but it's like i loved so many of the classes and the curriculum it's like hard to pick one so i'm going to pick several for different reasons yep. I, I think the thing that probably stands out is the the introductory computer science curriculum at stanford which is cs 106 a and b or if you knew how to program when you got there cs 106 x is phenomenal and it's phenomenal because it does this layered approach where they sort of give you progressive revealing of more details they also make you do real projects but the real secret sauce is they had undergrads as basically TAs. And it's this thing called the section leader program. Yep. And so you have undergrads grading the assignments and like grading the tests. Uh, once you get through CS 106 A and B, you can become what's called a section leader, which I did very quickly. And this was just a like, because it's one thing to learn something. It's another thing to have to teach it to other people. Yeah. Holy cow. And yeah. they're like asking questions. You're like, oh, gosh, I guess I didn't understand that, you know. Um, and then I eventually became a TA when I was a grad student and, and then had to make assignments. And like, that's a whole nother ball. Wow, I got to from scratch. Like, how do I make an assignment that teaches people about, you know, data structures? Um, so like that whole process of like leading, teaching, working with others was like, again, I think the fusion of the, the thing, like, 
because I have, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, I'm a technologist by background, but like my career ended up being a lot more about people, actually, people plus technology. Yeah. And I think that was the very beginning of the like, huh, like, this is magic because of all these people and you get all these really great motivated undergrads and they're excited to teach it to other undergrads. And like, it's sort of just magic. Um, yeah. and so that, that was probably formative. And then there's, you know, a bunch of just the, like, it was just fun to like, you just peeling layers of the onion back. It's like, Oh, that's how that works. Oh, that's, you know, networking compilers, computer graphics, operating systems. Like, um, even I, you know, I took, they stopped doing assembly. It was no longer required, but I took it anyway. And we made this like multitasker, you know, on, uh, it was a 68 K assembly, not nice. all 68 K. Um, and that was really fun too. And like, and there was a contest of how, how few instructions you could make one thing happen. And I spent a lot of time trying to win that contest. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know. There's a, there was a lot there that was just fun. You wrap up your time at Stanford and, um, yeah, then it's off to industry. Yeah, how did you choose? Like, because again, y- y- I'm sure there were so many options. Like all these startups, we've all these big companies. Like there was so much going on in the industry. Uh, you know, Stanford students like have this like crazy, uh, you know, crazy privilege of uh, yeah. being very highly sought after. So, uh, like, I'm guessing you had the opportunity to do a gazillion different things. Like, how did you pick? Again, back to experiments, I definitely treated my internships, my summers, as like a chance to run high-frequency experiments. So I was like, let me try lots of different things to kind of dial in what it is I want. So first summer was honestly whatever I can get. As a freshman to sophomore, it's like, it's really hard to get internships. It's like, whoever will give me a job in tech, I'll do it. I ended up working at Motorola back in Florida, um, mm. amusingly in their, their the factory where they made beepers. But we were I was on the software team helping them with compilers and stuff. Um, and then the next summer, I was like, I want a startup experience. So I went to Austin to work for a company called Trilogy Software that was about mm-hmm. 100 people, you know, enterprise software, sort of boring software, but an exciting startup. And then as I got further in my studies, I kind of hit my first love of in computer science, which was computer graphics. I was just like, computer graphics is so cool. You just like, again, can make beautiful things. And we were like, ray tracing was a thing. And how do you make it look beautiful? So my next job was at a computer graphics startup in Los Angeles working on movies. Um, and then the summer after that, I was like, that was really fun. Let me try doing computer graphics at a big company. So I actually interned at Apple um, on their QuickDraw 3D team. Nice. Which And this was the 90s of Apple, which was not a good time um, at Apple. And uh, actually my whole team got that whole project got canceled while I was there that summer. Oh, um, no. And so that's a, that's a very funny story that we can, we can, we could talk about. And then I was really into computer graphics. So the big industry conference is called SIGGRAPH. And so I went to SIGGRAPH that summer and this is going to date me, but like, because we were still kind of in the early days of the internet, there was literally like a resume board where you like put your resume up and you like tack it up there and then people. And so I was like, oh, I'll put my resume up for when I graduate because I was going to go to mass. I was going to stay for an extra year and do my master's. So when I graduate next summer, I can get a job. And I got a call from a recruiter who was working on this small company that was doing computer graphics for movies. It was uh, one of the main people in Industrial Light and Magic, and they were using kind of Macs to like do real time special effects. And I was like, well, that sounds interesting. So I went and I talked to them, and I thought I was going to be interviewing for a job, you know, in the next summer. And they're like, no, 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 no. We want you to start right now. We're a startup. We can't wait a year. And so I decided to defer my um, my master's degree because I was like, this is a fun. I was engineer number two at this little startup working on, you know, software for digital effects, which was kind of felt like just the most amazing thing to me. So that's that's sort of how I started. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit. So, like, I think both of those things are sort of fascinating experiences for someone in college to have. So, like, both. You know, getting your, uh, you know, getting your project canceled while you're an intern and like being employee number two at a startup, like they're, yeah. they're just fascinating learning experiences for different things. And I'm sure like valuable stuff for everything that you did after. You know, my, my recollection is this was 90, I think 96 or 97 at Apple and Apple was going through tough times. So they were sort of cutting projects here or there. And like about halfway through the summer, my my manager, who was amazing, calls me in his office and is like, hey, I want, I want to talk to you. And it was my recollection of this conversation is something along the lines of, you know, hey, so uh, this whole project is going to get canceled um, and everyone's going to get like reassigned or laid off. Um, but don't worry, like your internship basically is funded through the summer. 
So it was like, I need you to come into the office and like do some stuff, but none of the code, we're going to throw away the projects. So none of the code you've written is going to be used for anything. Um, and like, you would think as a, you know, 20, whatever year old, it's like come in for a couple of hours and like have the rest of the time off would be great. That sounds I was awful. miserable. I was, yeah. it was, I was like probably the saddest, uh, you know, had been in any work context that I can remember, you know, cause I was like, none of this matters. I was, it's like, I'm kind of like, I really wanted to build, I was like, I, I want to build stuff that people are using. I like, I was just told like, it's impossible at this point. And so that like was a kind of, a, just a linchpin in my mind of both like really matters where you are. The macro really matters economic conditions, how good the company's doing. And like, wow, I like, you know, I don't like sitting around. I like building stuff that people use. So, so that was one. And then the startup was a lot of fun because it was, you know, you know, I joke, I, I kind of like constantly got handed tasks that I wasn't qualified for because there wasn't anyone else to do it or I was stupid enough to like volunteer. And so, and, and so it was just a chance to try a lot of different things and, you know, write a lot of code. And I think it, it also created this moment that is like seared in my brain, which is, Okay, it was used for a terrible movie, so I'm just gonna just gonna caveat that I don't think this is a great movie. I'm gonna offend a lot of Star Wars fans, but it was so our our software was used on the Phantom Menace, and um, they were making it at the time. And um, Skywalk, we were in Sausalito, which is up in Marin County, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. ILM at the time was up in uh, up in the corner, like Lucas Ranch or whatever, where they were doing a bunch of the specs work. And so the founder of the company came up to me, is like, "Hey, the folks over at Lucas Ranch are like using the thing you've been working on." And they need some help. Can you go over there and help them? And so here's me as like a 22 year old, like driving my Honda Accord or whatever it is, you know, over to Lucas Valley Ranch, like signing this NDA, which like I always joke was like somewhere in there was embedded. Like if you reveal anything, we have Jedi's who will come get you, you know? <laughs> and so you sign this thing and then like open the door and there's like figurines from the movie on a giant table in front of you and a bunch of people in front of their computers. And they were working on the, one of the palace scenes with Padme um, and they're using literally the code I had written, which was this system around motion tracking. How do you find that object in the scene and then apply effects to it? And it was just one of these like, holy crap, like they're using my thing for this. Like, this is amazing. It was just like, again, back to like, there's nothing better than this. There's no like hobby I can think of that's more fun than we're building this thing. And then someone else is using it to do something awesome. That more than anything was a formative experience. And I think that the next lesson I learned, you know, the unfortunate thing is this was an amazing company with great people. Our software was like revolutionary. We were in a limited market. We like kind of sold it to everyone doing special effects, which was, you know, 10, 20,000 people. And we kind of had this like, now what moment, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, yeah. and so we struggled to try a bunch of different things. And again, back to the macro is like the macro conditions really matter. It's like great team, great company, great this, but like, we're selling a product that there aren't enough customers for. And like that eventually sort of, you know, made things hard. Um, and the company eventually sold and I, I, I decided to go off and do something else. Yeah. So, um, we, we don't have, uh, we don't have infinite amounts of time. Like you've done so much interesting stuff. So I'm going to fast forward past, uh, uh, like a bunch of things, uh, like including like what you probably are most well known for, which is your 15 years at Meta. But like, you know, maybe one thing there, like 15 years in Silicon Valley time is an awful long time to be at one place. And you still are there uh, as a as a senior fellow. So what what is it about Facebook slash Meta that uh, held your attention for as long as it has? Yeah, I think it basically boils down to three things. One is, it was never the same thing the time I was there. When I joined, it was Facebook.com, fewer users than MySpace, you know, web only, 100-ish engineers, you know, 15 years later, it's billions of people using our product. It's Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, Oculus VR systems, it's an AI research lab, like, and it's a much bigger organization. So you can imagine all the steps along the journey there. There was a lot, like, as we talked about earlier, how do I build a data center? How do I build four of them in parallel? How do I build 20 of them in parallel? How do we build a research lab? How do we sell consumer hardware? Like all of these things were like, whoa, this is, you know, this is like my graduate school. I get to like learn a bunch of things. So it was constantly and is constantly changing now. You know, even now, why am I still there? It's like, well, AI, you know, you know, we built PyTorch, which is the leading open source, you know, framework with a great cooperation with Microsoft, huge partners in that. You know, and then Llama is sort of the leading open source model out there. You know, um, I think it's been downloaded like 100 million times or something. And there's 19,000, 
forks of it. Um, and so it's like, hey, you know, if I can spend a little bit of my time and help build a technology, AI, long language models that can be leveraged by a lot of people because it's open source, like that seems like a worthy use of my time. So, and it's different than what we were doing five years ago. So it constantly changed is number one. You know, number two is love the people, you know, just continue to be, you know, Mark is just, just unbelievable. And there's a lot of lessons from, from him, but it's, it's not just Mark, there's tons of brilliant people there. Um, and then the third is, you know, this impact, how, how do I make, so great, I work on this AI model, but it's used by so many people. Like that is a great way for me to, again, get back to that. I do some work, we build something, a lot of people do awesome stuff with it. Yeah. Like that, that is like a through line through my whole, whole career. And so, yeah, so that's why I'm still spending time. You know, and I think there's this other interesting thing, too, about your work. Um, and, and even if we like you were uh, you were CTO at um, Mozilla before, uh, you know, before you went to uh, Facebook. Um, and so so much of what you have done has been platform building. Like you're you're building like apparatus for other people to build on top of, whether it's like Facebook's internal infrastructure, or face, Facebook itself, uh, yeah, web infrastructure. Like you, you chose like you, I, I hadn't heard this uh, you know, anecdote about your computer graphics into or startup experience before, but like even that's like a piece of infrastructure that other people are using yeah. to build things. So what is it that has attracted you to? making tools and infrastructure and systems and platforms. Uh, yeah. I mean, I just, just one small clarification. I was VP of engineering at Mozilla. We had, we had two amazing CTOs while I was yeah. there. So I would hate for them to, to think I was, I was them. Um, Cause they, they're amazing. But um, the um, it's a really good question. I think it, there's just something about it that intuitively like, I just, I love the idea of leverage. I mean, technology is leverage. I, you know, I'd always say that technology is one of those few things that, that, that removes constraints. So many problems in life, you know, if you've ever like the economics 101 you take in high school, where it's like, all right, you have a hundred dollar city budget, you know, you can either fund the libraries or the police or the fire department, but you can't fund all three fully. Like a, a lot of people live in a world every day where our problems are trade-offs. I can do this or I can do that. And technology is one of the only things is like, oh, hey, it's now half the price. <laughs> like these, these lithium ion batteries are actually 99% the price they were when they were like introduced on the market in 1991. 99% cheaper, like 1% of the price. Um, and they're still getting cheaper. And so you're just yeah. like, huh, I show up with this thing. It's just like better. That is, is like, is awesome. And I think that there's, for whatever reason, I have a, I think I have a decent intuition, like, Platforms are hard because you people like to think concretely, like, okay, what exactly am I going to use this for? What's the product? Who's the customer? And so when you're building a platform, you have to have a little bit of a leap of faith or an ability to believe, like, okay, here's what this is going to be used for. Um, and I, for whatever reason, I think I'm just pretty good at spotting. Like, I think this is the need. And I think if we build this, people will use it. And I think, you know, if you look at my time at Meta, it's React, it's PyTorch, like those are the things that I'm probably most proud of because they're things used by millions of people around the world that like fit a need better than anything else out there. Um, yeah. And so it just, I, I don't know what it is. I think I just have like a natural attraction to these lever points that just provide tremendous value for people. So, so maybe this is the perfect segue to what you're doing now. So in 2023, you co-founded uh, GigaScale with uh, Victoria and Eveline to invest in and I'm guessing accelerate uh, the development of technologies that will help with climate change. Uh, and like, I, I, I got to tell you, man, I'm every time I talk to you about what you're doing, uh, like I am so much more hopeful and optimistic about things than uh, than I was like the five seconds before I was talking to you. And so I mean, I, I guess why uh, why focus your attention on this, um, which may be an obvious question, and what makes you think you can have leverage there? Yeah, that that's the yeah. Got to have some humility. Let's have some real humility on this. So, so I think you know it starts with why, and I think I bet you a bunch of people watching this are sort of maybe thinking about this or struggling about this. So I think it's it's an important point, and like. It took me a while to figure out exactly what happened, but it was it was honestly during COVID. It was 2020. You know, the whole world was shut down. No cars on all my street here in Palo Alto, which is usually really busy. 
I had a weirdly, like I work lots of hours. And I had a weirdly all of a sudden extra time because not driving the kids around activities, you know, everything's on zoom. So we just like had a couple extra hours in the day. And like, it also just gave me this moment to reflect as the world was sort of in this crisis moment about like, what is my role in this world? Given everything we just talked about, like tremendous opportunity and fortune, what am I going to do with it? And we'd already been doing a bunch as you do philanthropic work in a variety of areas. But I was like, man, climate is this thing that's going, it's a platform problem. It's, it's going to impact tens or hundreds of millions of people. And the people most impacted are the least equipped to deal with the impacts. And so it's like, here I am with a bunch of resources. Like, isn't it just an obligation for me to go off and, and do this? Um, that's kind of where it started. And I started thinking it was going to be philanthropy. I was like, great, I'm going to direct more of my time and attention to philanthropy. Spent a lot of nights and weekends. And again, I got to have a learner's mind. It's like, I don't know anything about this. So I'm just going to learn really quickly about all of it. And that was a huge advantage because I just didn't have all of the baggage from, from before. Um, and that's where we, end, you know, I started doing a bunch of philanthropic things. We had spinning out a nonprofit last year that's working on a form of ocean carbon capture and funding a bunch of early stage science there. And then it was, again, back to high frequency experiments. It was like, okay, well, we're doing that. And then I kind of bumped into some entrepreneurs, like you're doing some really interesting stuff. And as I just went through it, it was like, look, we need to be spending trillions of dollars a year to rebuild our physical infrastructure, how we make energy, how we consume it, how we transport things, how we make food, how we live in buildings. That is not a problem that a government or a philanthropy can tackle with direct investment. Like you need the markets to basically, markets can do that. Markets can spend trillions of dollars a year. We spend about that in, you know, in oil and gas right now. Um, and markets do that when there's money to be made. So I think that it's like, okay, great. Where's the money to be made? And how do we take technological disruption back to my home? This thing's now half the price it used to be. I can now disrupt an incumbent and they don't know it yet. I was like, that's where I get excited. It's like, cool. We have new technology with these curves of batteries. We've got genome sequencing, so we're working on a vaccine for for cattle to to reduce their their um, their methane emissions. We've got um, you know uh, we've got solar cells, all of these things on a massive cost down curve. And then you start asking your questions like, where are the disruptions there, and who are the people that are going to do it? And so that's really the the foundation of it. And then taking all of this experience of building hardware teams, technology, and using it to help. You know, when I find a great entrepreneur who's got you know, Sarah Levinson, who's building uh, electrochemical cell to make ethylene. So when I'm making the pipes in your building, instead of doing all this dirty, nasty stuff with fossil fuels and emitting all these things, I have this nice little cell that just has electricity coming in. And then I make the chemical like, and that's really cool. But the cooler part is like, we think we can do it cheaper. <laughs> and so like the pitch to the customer is like, yeah, our thing's cheaper. Um, and oh yeah, oh, it's also really good for the environment. And like, that I just get so excited about. And like, I just want to spend my nights and weekends helping Sarah, um, you know, crush it because I think we have tons of things like that. Um, yeah. And that is leveraging a bunch of technological curves that are happening very quickly. And so I think this thing that you said about capital investment in markets is very interesting. And I, I wonder a lot about how you make sure that you have the right incentives set up inside of the market where the market uh, is playing the right game. Um, because like, look, you can spend trillions of dollars a year. And if you are not spending it efficiently, like getting it in the hands of the people who are most likely to make the big disruptive breakthroughs to, you know, sort of encourage the right set of things, which is not inventing stuff. It's like inventing stuff and then deploying it at scale yeah. and like making the unit economics of everything work. Like, I, I'm I'm a big believer in markets and I think markets can help. Uh like maybe maybe it's the best, you know, top level mechanism for making sure that the capital gets allocated efficiently. But is that a thing that you worry about? Um Yeah. And I think we're we're at different levels of maturity at different sort of technological stacks here. And so I, I think you gotta kind of attack the problem from both sides, meaning I, I can try I can disrupt the market because my technology innovation is now half the price of the incumbents. And so my low carbon thing is just cheaper than the high carbon thing because of technological advancement. Yep. Like that's, that's the easy button in. Right. And then there are other places where you need to bootstrap it a bit. Like maybe I'm not cheaper yet, but when I 10 X my scale, I am cheaper. And so that's where you see incentives, you know, government incentives, whether it be an EV tax credit or getting charging capability set up or, you know, carbon emission taxes for, 
you know, whether it's transport or aircraft or concrete or uh, cement, uh, I'm sorry, steel, you know, I think there are places where the governments can accelerate those things, you know, and, and, and get them there. I think that the useful thing about, you know, I basically am doing both philanthropy and investing, and I, I very clearly separate them. And philanthropy is like, great, we're going to fund early stage science. We're going to fund policy work. The output of that is a public good. It's something that everyone can see and use. There's no money to be made here. And then in the investing hat, I'm like, I'm only going to invest in this company because I think you have a business, right? You have a technology that at scale is fundamentally better or cheaper than the other alternatives out there. And what's surprising to me is like, there was a question in my mind of like, is there a lot of those or not? And the answer is there's a lot because there's so much inefficiency in the current market. I'll give you, you know, I talked about dioxycycle, which is making ethylene you know, cheaper than high carbon alternatives. I'll give you two other really quick ones. Arbor Energy, bunch of SpaceX engineers know how to make rocket engines and gas turbines. They're like, huh, all this like forestry waste we're pulling out of the California forest because we're going to try to prevent forest fires. Like all that stuff, like either piles up and sits and rots, which makes methane, which is bad. Or you put it into an old school biofuel plant, which is kind of like a big, huge wood fire. Terrible particulate you know, pollution. They're like, we spent all this time doing these high pressure, high oxygen burn things. If we can build a high pressure, high oxygen burn, we can basically take that same fuel source and like out of it is water and pure, a fairly pure stream of CO2. Water, we can actually do something with that CO2 we can inject in the ground or use as an input to another chemical process. And by the way, we're making energy. So it's like, it's, you can think of it as like energy producing carbon capture. We capture mm -hmm. carbon and we make energy. And like, that's kind of cool. Um, you know, and then you go in another direction with like a company who just invested in Arch and you say, look, we got heat pumps. I'm trying to heat and cool my home, air conditioning, heating. This magic heat pump technology is just like strictly more efficient than everything else out there. For most consumers, if you do the math, you're like, it's a little bit more money up front, but in a certain, but your, like, your bills go down every month. And so you ask yourself, it was like, why isn't everyone installing these? And you start going out and you talk to installers and they can't answer simple questions. The consumer's like, okay, this thing is $5,000. This thing is $10,000. You say it's cheaper. How long does it take to pay back? And they go, so of course everyone goes, I'll buy the cheap one. And so now you have a software solution that can do all this for you. It's like, oh, your payback period is 37 months. Do you want to do this? Yeah. Like, like hell yeah, I want to do that. So yeah. You're, it's a massive inefficiency in the market. You're attacking with technology, and like, yeah. and at the other end of it, a whole bunch of people are going to make a bunch, bunch of money. Installers are installing more heat pumps. Consumers save money. Like, it's just good. Yeah, that's what gets me excited. It's like yeah. every time I look at this, it's like, oh, huh, that's a pretty good opportunity right there. And we haven't yeah. even talked about the grid, which is a whole another thing, which you can spend another hour talking about. Well, let, let, let's talk about the grid actually, because I, I, I'm sure on multiple dimensions, the grid is uh, a source of concern for both of us. Uh, yeah, if you, you look forward um, a handful of years, the amount of energy that the world will need is just much higher than it is right now. And like, you know, and you can even imagine worlds where if you had abundant, cheap, sustainable sources of energy like you really could change a whole bunch of things about the world yep. like you wouldn't have water scarcity anymore like you know it, drinking water scarcity um but but like the, the grid is like this sort of interesting interesting thing like gi given the current momentum like you're only going to have the electric power industry like build you know this amount of capacity in a particular way like very few electric power uh companies like the operators like have r d functions so like there's nobody really doing a ton of r d about changing like how it is that you're actually doing generation um so like like talk about that i mean you must have thought yeah. about this way more deeply than i have yeah so this is both a deep concern and a massive opportunity <laughs> so <laughs> so i think that the like the short way to think about it is like electrical demand in the united states has been relatively flat you know over the last like two decades ish or decade or so and that's like good news because it basically means it's actually decoupled from gdp so we've been using about the same amount of energy and growing our gdp mostly because of technological efficiency led light bulbs things like that um which is awesome but it also means we've like lost the muscle on building lots of generation and distribution capacity yep. if you look at other countries like china they're like growing their grid capacity at a, at a massive rate um much faster than the us is so you start with like, are there physical laws and limits? It's like, 
nope, humanity can build this stuff really quickly. We just, for a variety of, you know, historical reasons, plus choices, plus regulations, aren't currently. So it's like, okay, good news, not violating laws of physics. And then you say, okay, increasing demand, that's one side. We're building a lot more factories in the U.S. now. We have data centers working on AI. Like, so that's creating increased demand. There's also this new set of supply that's very different than the old set, which is like wind and solar. So if you like look at ERCOT, Texas's grid, you know, on noon, about 50% of their power is wind and solar. Wind and solar is amazing. It is the cheapest form of energy generation we have ever had as humanity, but it doesn't work 24 seven. Everyone knows that. So now I have this new variable production and this increasing in demand, which are both new to the grid, right? Which creates disruption. Yep. Disruption equals startup opportunity. And there are so many different ways to attack this problem and they're hard, but I'm excited about it. On one level, grid storage is huge. If I've got these, you know, installing a commercial grid solar array is the cheapest form of energy generation and the most likely to be delivered on time, on budget of any project we know how to build because uh, they're so simple. So like people are building these at massive scales. You know, we're in that we're getting close to a trillion dollars of investment in this um, a year. And if I can then show up and say, oh, hey, I have this like thing I can put right next to your solar array that allows you to dispatch energy 24 seven. And by the way, people will pay you more money. They do this in Texas, you know, at 8 p.m. when it's peak power load. So like go ahead and charge the battery when energy is cheap and then discharge it when energy is really expensive. Like that's a really good business. <laughs> and so now there's a huge incentive for me to build grid storage in a way that 10 years ago, nobody cared. Nobody cares about grid storage and batteries, but like, so now we have companies like Form Energy. It's like, huh, uh, instead of using lithium ion batteries, I'm going to use this iron oxide battery. It's really cheap to make. It's bigger. It's heavier, which doesn't really work for a car, but who cares? It's on a big concrete pad. It's super cheap. Like that's going to be a great business. Um, you have a bunch of other people saying, huh, power lines are like rated statically, which means you rate them how much power you think they can hold, but like depending on how cool it is outside, you can probably put 30% more power safely through that. So maybe let's just put sensors on the power line and say like, it's cool to go 30% more power, it's fine. Like magically now I have more power. There's other companies saying like superconductors now work. We can like 5X the amount of power through this line via superconductor. So there's so many different ways to attack that problem. And I think the disruption causes the opening for these business models to exist. If I had superconducting power lines 10 years ago, nobody would care. If I had a grid battery, nobody would care. They're now trillion dollar businesses, um, business opportunities waiting for people. Um, and I, there's a lot other, and then we didn't even talk about fusion, um, which is, I'm really excited about, we're gonna do multiple bets in fusion, but I, that when you talk about AI data centers and you're building your latest, greatest new data center, you know, if I tell you, I can put, put a 250 megawatt facility right next to your data center on 20 acres that requires no inputs or outputs, you know, literally don't need a fuel line or anything, like one tanker truck will fuel this thing for a year, you're like, yeah, I'll take that. Like, yes. So, you know, there's a lot to do that's really hard. I don't want to overstate. And I don't want to overstate my role. But, like, part of my job is, to like, get behind and push. And like, can we get these things more and faster and more people thinking about this? And, like, that's the way forward. Yeah. So I, I think that is uh, – that's an excellent place to uh, end uh, here uh, with, with one last question. So um, I – I ask everybody who comes on the podcast what it is that they do in their spare time for fun. You've said several times now that like what you do is like better than any hobby that you could possibly have. But like, I'm going to ask, uh, ask anyway, uh, like, what do you do when you're not doing climate investing and senior technical fellowing at, uh, at Meta? Um, I, my, my favorite three things, number one by far is anything my kids will do with me. So I, you know, that spending time with the kids is, is number one. I'm like, a, I'm, a, I'm a decent skier and a mediocre surfer. So I'd love to go skiing, love to go surfing. I'll never be great at them, but they're a lot of fun. Um, but those are my, my three things, family, and then a couple of like being in the outdoors, doing silly things. Awesome. Well, it was, uh, it was amazing chatting with you. And uh, as always, I'm feeling more hopeful about our uh, future, hearing your high degree of enthusiasm for all of this climate tech stuff that you're investing in. Uh, so what whatever I can ever do to help you out, uh, like I, I just uh, want you to feel free to deputize me, uh, and uh, like I'm I'm I just glad you're doing what you're doing. So thank you very much. Keep 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 pushing AI. We need it. Like it's going to be a really helpful infrastructure platform for for a lot of stuff here, Kevin. So 
I think, and keep, keep telling the stories of technologists. And like, I think we have this shot at producing a much better future for everyone, you know, and that, 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 you know, that is worth getting up every morning and putting the shoes on and going to work for. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. All right, man. Thank you. Nice to see you. What a great conversation with Mike Schrepfer. So as you were kind of mentioning um, while you were talking with him and even at the top of, of the show, Kevin, like what's so striking to me is that what Mike is doing now, um, he was taking on challenging problems at, at, fa- at Meta, don't get me wrong, but what he's doing now is really challenging, but also really fascinating. And I'm really glad that someone like him with his experience is able to kind of bring that lens um, towards the investment approach and kind of the mentorship approach uh, to solve these these very big and very important challenges. Yeah, I mean, Mike, Mike and I have known each other for a really long time. And I have always been impressed, not just with Mike's technical expertise, which is tremendous, but the way that he tackles problems is so great. Um, you know, he dives into things. He's got, you know, a learner's mindset. Like he wants to learn as much as he possibly can. Like he's just a really great first principles thinker. Um, but like he he's led so many complicated things and done things with such big groups of people that he understands, you know, just the complexity of yeah, just how to get a large number of very bright people aligned on a mission and, you know, how to go tackle really, really tough problems. And that's exactly what we've got here. And, and, you know, if anything, I think the bag of problems that he's tackling are sort of the toughest in the world uh, because you, you have a, you have a problem that is, very big and very imminent. Uh, it will not wait on any of us. Uh, it's coming whether we like right. it or not. Um, and you you have even worse than we have some cases in software where you're like trying to go fix something where you've got decades worth of prior investment and like you've got to solve these problems of, you know, like what can I reform versus what do I have to like just tear down to the ground and like rebuild from scratch in order to solve the problem the way it needs to be solved. Uh, So here we've got centuries in some cases of uh, things that are, you know, sort of been institutionalized and lots of investment that we've made in them that you have to understand how the new fits into that. Um, And, you know, and then you have a complicated regulatory environment that sits on top of all of that. And so, you know, it's just great to have someone like Mike uh, trying to push really hard to empower entrepreneurs to go, uh, you know, help us find some solutions to these uh, to these tough, tough problems. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And I feel like he is really uniquely positioned to to kind of do that because of his experience. And uh, I think it's it's notable, like his investment firm is called Gigascale. And that's certainly something that he's done in his career, building platforms, as you two were discussing. And that's that's such an interesting thing to me, too. Um, you've also worked a lot on on building platforms, and you know what it's like to make things have to scale. and And I feel like with these problems that that the Mike is investing in now, scale is really what's necessary. what's What's your experience, I guess, kind of uh, you know, Mike, Mike alluded to this talking about kind of needing to understand, you know the the amount of momentum you need for something. Um, but what's what's your experience with, I guess, kind of figuring out when you need to take something from maybe being, all right, this is this size, but if we want this to actually uh, be impactful and actually work, we need to go, you know, we can't just build one data center. We need to build, you know, forty of them at the same time. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, and and look, it's it's no uh, no accident that Mike and I. Uh, our friends and that we've uh, always got along because he and I share uh, many of the same guiding principles for how you go tackle problems. Um, you know, I, I think the the very best way that you can get change made at scale is to sort of use uh, systems that are already in place to assist you. So like the thing that Mike talked about a bunch, which is like, 
just letting the markets work, like finding things that are yeah, that are leverage. genuinely and authentically superior uh, and sustainable to the uh, unsustainable things that are, uh, yeah, that are already in the marketplace, and uh, you know the incumbents who are making them. I, I think it, it just does wonders every time we apply it anywhere. So it makes the incumbents better, and it presents an option to the incumbent. Uh, that you know, even if the incumbents being especially intransigent, uh, like you know, everybody's just going to adopt the alternative, um, and so like that, using that market mechanism and that comp- competition uh, is, I think, a really really effective thing. Um, you know, he mentioned another thing which is really interesting, um, which is you know this heat pump anecdote that he gave, where you know there there's a new heat pump technology that might be twice as expensive as the existing technology. And if you just knew uh, that, you know, that 2x upfront cost meant that your long term operating costs are going to be much less over the lifetime of the right of the system, like it's easy to choose the 10k upfront. Uh, And so there, you know, the the market making thing is just making sure that the consumer understands, uh, you know, what the trade off is. And like, maybe you also need a policy thing uh, up front, which is, you know, how do you subsidize or, uh, you know, allow the consumer to make that upfront investment? I mean, like we, we just sort of take for granted a bunch of things about our financial markets right now, but like we don't give loans out to people just for grins. Like, you know, you, you, you loan right. people money because it lets them invest upfront in things that are long-term efficient. Like if, if that weren't the case, like, you know, uh, the financial industry would be, you know, loan sharking and uh, like none of it would make any sense. And so... Yeah, let letting the letting the market efficiently allocate capital where it can and like where it's not like changing the rules of the marketplace so that uh, like that efficient allocation of long term efficient allocation of capital can happen is super, super important, I think. No, I totally agree. And I also think what you were saying and what Mike was talking about, too, you know, making sure that people can understand, as you said, that trade off, understand how that market allocation is going to work um, and and why it might be worth, you know, the initial outlay uh, is great, too. But no, I think those are are fantastic points. And I'm I'm really glad that Mike is taking his expertise from building platforms and and applying them towards these these other problems, too. Yeah. And look, in, in addition to the client investing he's doing, like, I think part of our conversation was just sort of super interesting because Mike, again, has had one of the legendary Silicon Valley careers. Uh, You know, like not everybody gets to go from uh, Boca Raton, Florida to, you know, being, uh, you know, CTO, uh, you know, for as many years as Mike was of like one of the iconic, uh, like big platform companies in technology. Uh, And I think Mike shared a whole bunch of like super interesting stuff uh, from how he even approached his career that uh, like even if you're not going to go be the CTO of a big uh, tech company uh, is going to serve you incredibly well as you you progress through life and try to figure out how to do valuable and rewarding things. No, I, I totally agree. And and his run, you know, he he was at Facebook for more than 15 years, but his run, you know, as a CTO is, you know, co- aligns with, you know, one of the greatest kind of growth stories of any tech company that we've we've seen. And uh, I think, as, as you said, even if you're not a CTO, just kind of looking at that approach and looking at kind of the decisions that he made, you know, in the tools, you think he mentioned, you know, PyTorch and React uh, that can touch so many people. Um, has been incredibly influential and I think is incredibly inspiring. Yeah. And, you know, and and the techniques for how he manages career, like run experiments with your career. Like, what can you yes. learn? Like, you know, how, how can I go line my activity up with, uh, you know, I'm going to go learn a thing that's going to help me make better decisions about my career in the future. Um, you know, like thinking about leverage, thinking about, uh, markets, like, you know, making sure that you're landing in places where your effort and activity is going to be, uh, you know, for macroeconomic reasons, is going to be aligned with the potential for high impact. Um, and, and taking risks yeah. too, right? Like, you know, de- deferring your master's to go, you know, uh, do something um, uh, 
for, you know, working at a startup and um, having that experience, sometimes taking those bets, which is also what he's doing now as an investor. Yeah. And like it's a Warren Buffett quote, but it's a good one. Uh, Like the best investment anybody can make is in themselves. Uh, And so just yeah, really, really thinking about like, how am I getting better? Like, how do I improve? How am I learning more? Like, how am I putting myself in situations where, you know, my my growth is, uh, you know, increasing or has the option to increase? Like, I think those are all good questions for all of us to be asking ourselves all the time. I totally agree. I totally agree. Everybody keep learning. All right. Well, that is all of our time that we've got for today. Huge thanks to Mike Schreffer for joining us. If you have anything that you would like to share with us, please email us anytime at behindthetech at microsoft.com. You can follow Behind the Tech on your favorite podcast platform, or you can check out our full video episodes on YouTube. Thanks so much for listening. See you next time.